Okay, we had uh, a lot to cover today in class and did not quite get through everything. Uh, and I also was going a little bit fast with the coding. So I wanted to uh, kind of slow down a little bit and fill in some of the remaining uh, details so that you're able to finish up your homework assignment. So again, we're working from the classifiers uh, uh, module, module five. Uh, some of this we did the coding for, others I provided for you. So let me go ahead and uh, execute a set of cells. Uh, all of these functions I provided for you. And what we loaded up was K2W10. Uh, and what was unique about this data set or what was new about this data set was that we had a lot of other points on the body, not just the wrists. Um, let's see. So uh, this cell was all about trying to get a list of all of the kinematic variables, the position variables. And then we were also creating a list that included both kinematic, the position and the velocity uh, variables. For the uh, pipelines, we actually created two different pipelines, uh, sorry, three different pipelines. The pre-pipe pro processed all of our data. Uh, so we're computing a derivative. The data sample dropper is a little bit different than what we've done in class prior and what you're doing in homework. Um, here, we're just dropping data that, that uh, has any NANDs whatsoever. So we're not trying to do any repair of the data set like what you're doing for the homework assignment. And then this pre-pipe uh, acts as a an input uh, into potentially other kinds of pipelines. So the one that we're going to end up using is the data frame selector. This is just what you have in the book. Uh, what it does is it takes its input, a data frame with all of our position velocity fields, a uh, data frame that has all of the, the data, including position velocity, returns a NumPy array that contains just the selected uh, uh, columns. So here, this, this was uh, making use of those pipelines. So in particular, our, uh, our pre-pipe is doing that data cleanup to give us a new data frame. And then that we're using in a couple of different ways. One is we're pulling out the position velocity uh, data. And in particular, these uh, the, this is a NumPy array that has uh, just the, the position velocity data. And then we're also pulling out the SIPSI action uh, variable from the data set, as well as the time variable from the data set. So or just a reminder about the SIPSI action that translation is is here. Uh, so this is the discrete assistance uh, that the robot can be providing to the infant at any given instant in time. Uh, zero means there is no such assistance. One and five are forward, two and six are backwards, etc. These are for power steering. So these are triggered uh, using force against the ground by the infant and these uh, five through eight are triggered from the uh, from the kinematic suit, the, the motion capture suit that the infant is is wearing. Uh, okay, so um, what what we did in class was to construct a model that used these data as inputs to try and predict whether or not this was non-zero. So, so the question we're answering right now, uh, or at least down below, is uh, we, we would like to build a model that can predict uh, by looking at the infant's position velocity uh, information, whether or not the, uh, the robot is providing some form of assistance. And then we can become much more specific as, as necessary. Uh, this particular data set, we have almost 10,000 samples. So, uh, and then there are 78 different variables in that position velocity data set. 
uh, this is us just translating this this action, the zero through eight number into just a binary uh, set of binary variables, uh, whether or not some action is being produced. And we can become more, much more specific at another time. So this is our classifier. And what we're trying to do is predict uh, from uh, position and velocity data So there are a couple of different things going on. One is there are specific things that the infant is doing that can trigger these movements. And then once a movement is triggered, there are certain kinds of things that happen. So for example, if the infant is touching the ground and the robot starts to move forward, their hands, if they're touching the ground, will naturally be pulled backwards. Uh, so we'll be able to see that in, in the data set as well. Um, here we're setting up uh, our SGD stochastic gradient descent classifier. We, I gave you a hint about this uh, last week. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, on Thursday. Uh, but this is doing this. What it does is it guesses an initial random uh, f linear f function, and then it does gradient descent. Uh, in this particular case, it's using uh, something called log loss. I haven't defined that yet. We'll talk about that on uh, on Thursday. Uh, but if we can find a, a good minimum in that log loss space, then uh, then hopefully we can be distinguishing between no assistance and and assistance and doing that well. This particular uh, classifier or all all of our classifiers, uh, are estimators, and so they implement the fit function. In this particular case, we're when we call fit, it is uh, it, it is uh, going about estimating all of those parameters in in the model. So, so there we go. Uh, let's look inside of those. So this will tell us all of the different properties in uh, of this associated with this object. A bunch of these are built-in properties, uh, but if we look, uh, if we look uh, in here, we can uh, we can find uh, some useful things to actually look at. So. Uh, we're not using class weights, uh, but in this case, we just have a binary classification problem. So the classes are going to be zero uh, and one. Uh, the decision function gives us access to the uh, the F. What is, what is the F for a given uh, input? We can also ask it to predict and uh, that is uh, this function right here. So that gives us a binary output, yes or no, uh, that we're uh, that we're in in the class or outside of the class. We can also ask uh, uh, what the probability is that we're predicting with. So this is the g of f of x function that we have already talked about. So so you can you you can make use of the decision function as a scoring function you can also use the predict probe as a scoring function as well as if you need to uh if you need to be able to interpret those outputs as probabilities uh okay so uh let's go ahead and move on so these are all built-in functions for this particular uh, class, and I was hoping to find uh, some other uh, variables, but I do not find what I'm looking for. Okay, um, so let, let's go ahead and move on from here. So we've trained up our classifier already. Uh, here I'm asking what that f of, f function is going to be. So this is this is f of x, uh, and and this is really, uh, this is going to give us the uh, class assignments. So positive or negative, and specifically, it's going to be encoded as zeros and ones. Uh, 
uh, depending on And so by default, we talk a lot today about thresholds. Uh, in this particular case, by default, the threshold is uh, for f of x is, is zero. We've already cr created this uh, function. Uh, this was the true, uh, the, the true thing that we're trying to predict. This is the output from f and uh, I am shifting it down by five. So the the decision line is right here at negative five. And so the, so we I was showing you this right at the very end. Uh, but if we cut this at just the right point, any time you see black, you will also see a corresponding blue uh, up here. And, and you can see for this particular choice of threshold, this default choice, our function's only doing sort of okay at uh, capturing where where red is high. All right, so we we talked a lot in class today about looking at histograms of scores. Uh, this particular case here, I'm just uh, plotting the uh, creating a histogram of the entire set of scores for every uh, point uh, in this data set. Uh, in this case, there are 31 different bins that we've cut the data into, and it will automatically decide what the range is of those of the individual bins based on the data itself. Uh, so that's that's the histogram total in total of scores. But really, what we want to be able to do is visualize what's happening uh, for the ground truth positive examples and the ground truth negative examples. And uh, we talked about this in detail in class, but normally what we're doing is we're we're splitting the scores into positive and negative uh, examples. And those are ground truth positives and negatives. Uh, and then here we're plotting. I guess I shifted my, okay, number of bins is still 31. Um, the, the extra bit of magic here with a histogram by setting the alpha uh, to something other than the default one, where we end up with a, a transparent picture here. And and there was, a, we were looking at this right at the very end of class and didn't get a chance to really talk so much about it, but uh, yes, it's the case that blue largely overlaps orange, but you can see that the mass of blue is more to the right-hand side uh, than uh, than orange is. And so we there's some skill here that we've learned. It's not a great amount of skill, but we have learned some skill. Um, so let, let's look at this. Um, uh, let's see. Label action. Okay, so um, first off, let's look at a confusion matrix. Oops. And label action. So confusion matrix is a scikit-learn built-in uh, function that Uh, that that will com construct a confusion matrix given a set of uh, uh, two binary vectors. So these are the trues here. And uh, we also have our uh, predictions that our model is, is making. And uh, this is the same form of the matrix that we saw, uh, that, that we were talking about in class. So. Uh, so these are the true negatives right here. These are the true positives uh, over here. And then uh, we have uh, our um, uh, our off diagonal elements are where our errors are. And you can see we're making a lot more errors on this side. So so here the threshold was was uh, right here. Uh, so, so the this 168 corresponds to all the orange that's right, uh, right in here. The 
24, 13 is all the blue that falls to the left of, of zero. And, and so if, if we wanted to change the balance of this, what we could do is alter the, the threshold uh, a little bit. Okay, so let's do an example of altering the uh, the the threshold. So uh, I'm going to set the threshold to negative uh, one, and I'm going to create a new set of predictions. So we we received our original predictions here from uh, from up here right there, where we're asking the classifier to do predictions directly. And it's assuming that default threshold of zero, but we can we can use that threshold and compare it against our scores to, to make predictions as well. So uh, let's do that. It helps when I spell fresh correctly. Uh, not pred2, but pred new. And there we go. So you can see now we have moved uh, a, a large number of elements here uh, into this cell over here. So now this number is a lot larger. And we've new, moved a relatively large number of elements from here over to this uh, cell over here. So that's that's a threshold of, of negative one. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, so, so we talked uh, in class about uh, false positive rate and true positive rate and having those vary as a function of our choice of threshold. And this can be really illustrative of the kinds of skill that our uh, model has actually uh, uh, produced. And then we can make intelligent choices as to what appropriate thresholds are. So we're gonna go into making creating ROC curves. And there is a nice scikit-learn uh, function called ROC curve. Uh, and it takes as input the true binary outputs. And instead of taking predicted binary outputs, it is going to take our scores. And the result of this In this, in this case, uh, what ROC curve has given us is uh, 3,479 different uh, thresholds. And so those are uh, set here, or the, the thresholds will contain all of those. And then for each one of those thresholds, it computes the, the false positive rate and the true positive rate for us. So let's plot this. There's our TPR, and we're going to plot our FPR as well. We'll make those red. And we talked about how important it is to know something about the difference between those two. Uh, let me go ahead and explicitly compute that. Um, 
actually, let me do one other thing here. We in class, I talked about wanting to invert the direction of the uh, of the horizontal axis. In order to do that, we actually need to be operating on axes specifically. So this is going to occur. This this call gives us both a figure and then an axis that lives within the figure. And instead of plotting to the figure itself, or at least implicitly, we're going to plot to that particular axis. And that's going to give us some extra capabilities here. So there, there's that method there that will allow us to invert that axis. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and set our labels. So vertical axis is probability. And let's create a legend as well. So there we go. So there's, there's our true positive uh, rate curve in blue there. False positive rate comes in just a little bit later. Notice that that horizontal axis is in, inverted from the default. And the maximum difference occurs right at this point here, which is just a little bit less than negative 0.1. In fact, we can, we can now ask what the what the maximum value is of that diff vector is 0.31. And we can also ask, and this is useful information for your homework assignment. Um, this tells us, so argmax gives us the index within this vector for which uh, the value is maximum. So 1932 uh, out of our 3000, 479. Okay, so uh, so the so I would I would argue that this is not a huge amount of skill. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's just for fun. Let's also look at. Uh, Let's look at what that threshold is. That's the variable is called thresholds. So the max threshold is just a little bit bigger than negative one. I'm kind of surprised by that, actually. There's our, our negative one. OK, I guess it is just a little bit larger than negative one. OK, so our guess originally of negative one is not not such a bad guess. So we do have some some real skill here uh, when we choose that negative one. If this set of samples is representative of the true distribution, then uh, with this negative one, we're going to end up with something uh, looks like about 65 percent of the time for a sample that the, gra the ground truth is that it's a true example. We're going to label it uh, correctly. And with a probability of about 0.3 for any ground truth negatives, we're also going to uh, label it uh, as positive. So we're going to get it incorrect. So not the best scenario, but there is some real skill uh, here, uh, at least for this data set that we're looking at. Uh, in practice, though, that's not not going to uh, work quite as well uh, for the general case. For your homework assignment, the prediction problem that you have, uh, you do have more skill to work with. Okay, so let's actually plot a a, a proper ROC curve, uh, and that is TPR as a function of FPR.
There we go. Uh, and I'm going to also add the dotted line. Reason my X key is not cooperating. Uh, so this dotted line goes from zero zero to one one. So we're so the X coordinates are zero and one respectively, and then the corresponding Y coordinates are zero and and one. And we're going to make that in red and make it a dashed line. Uh, in general, when you are plotting one variable against another for which the uh, the units are the same, uh, you should make sure that the aspect ratio, uh, in general, the aspect ratio should be the same. There are exceptions to this rule, but uh, in this case, this is particularly important. That really helps the interpretation. So that sets us up to set to have a equal aspect ratio, and we're putting we're putting a box around this as well. All right, so let's set the labels. And there we go. There's our uh, ROC curve. Uh, so this uh, so so this curve is passing above this dash line here. Remember that dash line. This is equivalent to just guessing equally. Uh, if the curve drops below the dash line, the blue drops below the dash line, then that's not really the best situation to be in because you're actually doing worse. Your classifier is doing worse than uh, uh, what uh, random guessing uh, gives you. All right, so we can also ask what the AUC is, and the AUC function is exactly what what we want. So this is just shy of 0.7. So so there's a little bit of skill here. Uh, it's not the it's not the best skill. We would really rather be more at 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kind of a range, but it's certainly not uh, at 0.7. Incidentally, if you reverse the order of these two, uh, TPR comma FPR, you end up with 0.3. The sum of those, of course, has to be one. Okay, so so this is uh, these are the essential details that you need to finish up with the latest homework assignment. Uh, you'll of course you'll you'll be producing figures that look a lot like what we've done here, uh, but you'll be adding a little bit of extra information to it as you uh, as, as you go. So uh, please do ask questions on on Slack or in the office hours, and uh, I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you much.